He's on. Yeah. Okay, let's grab our seats. Well, I, I decided. Let's get our uh, very first CTR outdoor service started as you're all out there in the heat. So get this thing, get this thing going. Uh, if you're out there at home, welcome. And uh, we'd love to have you at our, at our next outdoor service. It's a couple announcements. First of all, you should be expecting a, a uh, letter in the mail that has a, an email that has our bylaw changes that we've been working on. So they need to be approved by the membership. So if you see those, you need to look them over. We'll be having a Zoom meeting for your any questions, and then we'll be having a vote on it coming up. So take a look at those. Also, expect a call. If, if we have your information, if we have your number, and you attend our church in any way, we're going to be trying to call you, contact you find out what's going on with you, and get so, gather some data as we plan for the fall and uh, kind of regathering in the next phase. Also, you should know there are restrooms today. You just have to go right over there uh, and in the church building and there's a restroom, or there's a door back there into the office and there's a restroom on the right. And uh, let's start our, our worship by looking at uh, our hearing from the psalmist in Psalm 93. The Lord reigns. He is robed in majesty. The Lord is robed. He has put on strength as his belt. Yes, the world is established. It shall never be moved. Your throne is established from old. You are from everlasting. The floods have lifted up, O oh Lord. The floods have lifted up their voices. The floods lift up their roaring, mightier than the thunders of many waters, mightier than the waves of the sea. The Lord on high is mighty. Your decrees are very trustworthy. Holiness befits your house, O Lord, forever. Let's pray. Father, you do reign on high, and you are mightier than the floods of this world, mightier than the thunders, and you are trustworthy. May we come this morning trusting in your perfect, solid, powerful word, Help us to put aside any anxieties and fears and distractions of the weak and just rest in you. Holiness befits your house and may we come in that tenor for our worship this morning. In your son's name, amen. All right, well, let's stand and sing. Yes, let's stand and sing together with one heart, one voice, rejoicing in the saving work of Jesus Christ.
a privilege to sing with you again and worship the Lord that way. It's funny how we end up missing those things so easily. Well, our first scripture reading this morning is found in Isaiah chapter 62, verses 1 through 5. Isaiah 
Isaiah 62, verses 1 through 5. For Zion's sake I will not keep silent, and for Jerusalem's sake I will not be quiet, until her righteousness goes forth as brightness, and her salvation as a burning torch. The nations, the nations shall see your righteousness, and all the kings your glory, and you shall be called by a new name that the mouth of the Lord will give. You will be a crown of beauty in the hand of the Lord, and a royal diadem in the hand of your God. You shall no more be termed forsaken, and your land shall no more be termed desolate. But you shall be called, My delight is in her, and your land married. For the land delights in you, for the Lord delights in you, and your land shall be married. For as a young man marries a young woman, so shall your sons marry you. And as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, we will go right into our confession this morning. This is a time where we come together as a body and recognize, not just individually, that we've sinned against the Lord and not glorified Him in that way, but as a body, we've done that as well. So please take time to have this confession on your hearts. It's at the top of your handout, and we will confess together. Let us confess together. Almighty Father, we gather today in your presence, and we confess the things we pretend to conceal from you, and the things we try to conceal from others. We humbly present ourselves to you for pardon and mercy. Because of Christ's faithfulness, we ask forgiveness and cleansing. Through him, grant that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. And may it result in your glory. Amen. And the scriptures remind us in 1 John that God the Father is faithful to forgive those who confess through his Son, Jesus Christ. Well, now we will continue singing together. just to stand together but uh, being outside and different health needs you you follow uh, whatever you need regarding your health but uh, if you can let's let's stand and worship together
Father use my ransom life in any way you choose. Let my song forever be my only boast is you. Scripture reading today comes to us from the Gospel of Mark. We'll be reading from Mark chapter 2, verses 18 through chapter 3, verse 6. So Mark chapter 2, verse 18. Chapter 2, verse 18. Now John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting. And people came and said to him, Why do John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees fast? But your disciples do not fast. And Jesus said to them, Can the wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast in that day. No one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. If he does, the patch tears away from it, the new from the old, and a worse tear is made. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins. If he does, the wine will burst the skins, and the wine is destroyed and so are the skins. But new wine is for fresh wineskins. One Sabbath, he was going through the grain fields, and as they made their way, his disciples began to pluck heads of grain. And the Pharisees were saying to him, Look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And he said to them, Have you never read what David did when he was in need and was hungry, he and those who were with him, how he entered the house of God in the time of Abiathar the high priest and ate the bread of the presence? which it is not lawful for any but the priest to eat, and also gave it to those who were with him. And he said to them, The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord, even of the Sabbath. And again he entered the synagogue, and a man was there with a withered hand. And they watched Jesus to, set, to see whether he would heal him on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him. And he said to the man with the withered hand, Come here. And he said to them, Is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save life or to kill? But they were silent. And he looked around at them with anger, grieved at their hardness of heart, and said to the man, Stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out, and his hand was restored. The Pharisees went out and immediately held counsel with the Herodians against him how to destroy him. This is the word of the Lord. And now Brian will be coming up for our pastoral prayers.
Jay said, my name is Brian Jensen, and I'm one of the elders here at Christ the Redeemer. <clears throat> Please join me in prayer. Our gracious and loving God, as we gather together this morning, it is so good to be outside in your creation, on the grass that you created, warm by the sun that you created, amongst our friends and family that you created uniquely in your image. With all that is happening in the world, we thank you for the gift of prayer, where we can humble ourselves before you, speak to you of our needs, and honor you with our thanksgivings, and listen for your voice in our lives. Thank you for the gift of prayer. <clears throat> and it is just one of many gifts you've given us. We thank you and praise you for so many amazing blessings in our lives, for our daily bread, for this church and the fellowship of the saints, for the encouragement of believers around the world who share a common faith, and most of all, for your son, Jesus Christ, and the tremendous sacrifice he made on the cross for our sins so that we might be able to have a right relationship with you. You are the great God of all mercies and all comfort. So we are confident to bring our cares, our needs, and our worries before you. Your faithfulness in the past gives us hope for our future. Life here on earth is definitely not perfect. It can be very hard, and we do need to cling to you. Disease and death are ever present and will continue to be so until you return to take us home. Lord, we continue to lift up those in our body, those in our lives and people around the world who are sick, under or even unemployed or in other ways aff affected by this pandemic. Um, may your love and peace, Lord, cover our fears, renew our strength, heal our sicknesses, and drown out any uncertainty that we might be feeling or experiencing. And Lord, um, as for the disease of racism, may the truth of the gospel be recognized as the only cure and grant us wisdom and grace to understand the role we play in the reconciliation of a broken and hurting world. We also want to continue to pray for the marriages in this body, protect these unions, and may you, your word, and a whole lot of prayer be at the core of these relationships. And as numerous churches gather this morning around our city, we do want to pray specifically for Indian Trail Church, Senior Pastor Kyle Schwan, and the other pastors and elders leading the body there. We are thankful for the partnership and the gospel we share with Indian Trail. And we would ask that you continue to bless their ministry and may they continue to be a light for you where they live and serve, preaching the good news of Jesus to all those who enter their doors. And as we look beyond the Spokane area, we continue to lift up our missionaries around the world. Dave and Stephanie Bogart in Peru, the Mallets who are back in the States on furlough from Niger, John and Catherine Bogart in Indonesia, Naomi Sen here in Spokane, Dan and Ava Anderson, Sam and Maitre, Avin Abiba, and Emily Roth who are all serving in Spain, Ken and Sue Richards in Australia, May you fill them all with boldness and grace and the energy and words to fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel to those who do not yet know you. Please also keep them safe, keep them healthy, and please open up new opportunities for ministry. Finally, Lord, please bless Kerry as he opens up this passage in Mark. Give him clarity and insight, and may we be open to hearing the truth, the challenge, and the call in your word. Thank you for listening to our prayers. It is an incredible honor to come before you this morning. Amen. Okay, if you'd open up your Bibles, back to Mark uh, chapter 2, starting at verse 18. first this morning I have a prop for my sermon. I remembered when I uh, looked at this passage that when I taught it years ago to the junior hires I, I used a box as my illustration. So my main illustration today is a box and the reason for that is that people like boxes. We all like boxes. I grew up across the street from the, the Fellows was their name. Their last name was the Fellows 
their fellows manufacturing. Uh, you've seen the banker's box, it has fellows on it. They invented the banker's box and they've sold billions of them because people like boxes. They like to be able to put things in a box and label it and organize it and put it on their shelf. Boxes give us those, that sense of completion, that sense of uh, control. We've got things categorized and put away. And you know, there's actually, if you're sitting there wondering what's in the box, there's nothing in the box. But metaphorically, there always is something in the box, right? We put things in boxes. We do this with our minds, right? We like to make things very neat. We may have an entertainment box in our mind, and we've got all those things that we think are fun in that box. It's very organized. We know there's things that don't go in there, and there's things that do. We, we, we do this with, with people, right? People categories. We have those, uh, those boxes. Um, there may be the box that's just the, the bad people box, and then the good people, maybe a black and a white box, right? We have our political boxes, right? We put people in those different boxes. We have our personality box, type A, and outgoing, nerd, cool, not cool, athlete, student, whatever. We're always organizing and putting things in boxes in our minds. And if the problem is sometimes we find a person or a, or, or a thing that doesn't quite fit in one of our boxes. That's always a struggle. If you ever physically, if you're moving and you have that item that doesn't fit in a box, what do you do with it? I don't like that. I usually throw it away. <laughs> this is really what our passage is about today. It's about what I like to call the religion box. That box in our minds that contains those thoughts about God and how you can know God, and what it looks like to please God, and how one can get close to God and be accepted by God. The religion box. For some of us, that box may be very small, because we don't believe in God, we don't think it's real, so maybe it's just a little box with a question mark in it. And maybe it's dwarfed by the big science box in our mind that's just full of stuff, because we think that's where ultimate reality is. Or maybe our, uh, our religion box is huge because we grew up at, uh, at church. We have all kinds of deep thoughts about religion and learning and rituals because it's been a big part of our lives. That's probably most of us here. That's why we're at church today. We have a pretty big religion box. And if that's you, I think you can relate today to the main characters in this text you see, this section of Mark contains four stories where the religious elite of Jesus' day, the Pharisees and the scribes, are interacting with him. And we see very clearly revealed when we look at these stories, we see their religion box, what they think it's all about. And believe me, these guys were the experts of their time. They had dedicated their lives to knowing and pleasing God to knowing his laws and obeying it. People would come to them as models of true religion. They were the, the pastors, the Bible teachers, the rabbis of their day. They have a strong, developed religion box. But the problem that you'll see in this text is that Jesus doesn't quite fit in it. In fact, he doesn't fit in it at all. So there's this tension. If you look at our text today, if you're taking notes, I would underline in each of these stories the word why. In fact, if you start just before a text with Jesus called Levi, you look at verse 16, it says, why? Why does he eat with sinners? Verse 18, why? Verse 24, and the Pharisees were saying to him, look, why are they doing that? Each time they're questioning Jesus sort of structures the whole text. And we see in these situations, these conflicts, their religion box. And I want to start with the very first story of conflict, the first very aspect of religion, their religion that we see here. And that comes from Jay's sermon last week, 
with the calling of Levi just before our story in verses 13 to 17. If you remember the story, Jesus walking by the Sea of Galilee, he sees this tax collector, Levi, and he calls Levi to follow him, to leave his tax booth and literally begin to follow him. And surprisingly, he does. And we learned last week from Jay that Levi was a very bad guy. Tax collectors were those guys who had buddied up with the Romans so that they could get rich, work for the Romans, collecting taxes from their own people. In fact, I was reading about it th this week and I, I learned that it was an auction system. That the Roman governor of the area would say, hey, who, who wants to collect taxes? And somebody would come and say, hey, I can collect $100,000 in taxes from people. And somebody else would say, hey, I can collect 200000 Somebody else comes and says, I can outdo that. I'll do 500000 He'd say, sold. And then that person would have to pay him up front, the, gov the government, that 500000 Then they would work for the government, and they could go and force and take the taxes. And anything they got beyond that was theirs. And they had the, you know, the Roman soldiers behind them. So they would sit by the roadside and go into houses and collect taxes for everything. And they were hated as the worst of sinners. But think about it. It also meant a huge cost for Levi when Levi said, I'm going to follow. Guess what that meant? He doesn't get his 500000 back. Right? And on top of that, he has to give it all up to follow Jesus. And he did. But here's the amazing thing. The story goes on, and Jesus takes Levi, and they have this party where he invites all his tax collector friends and his sinful friends, and they're having a party together. And the Pharisees and the scribes look at this, and they can't get their minds around it. They say, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? What does that tell you about their religion box? What is it they think is being truly religious? Well, it means you must separate yourself from sinful people. True religion. I'll write it on here. It means separation from That's what, that's what a truly religious person will do. They will stay away from sinners so that they're not contaminated by them. What Jesus is doing is spiritually dangerous to them. And he should know better as a rabbi. Now, in a way, this sounds kind of right, if you think about it. It's like the practical wisdom that we give to our kids. Stay away from bad influences. Watch out who you hang out with, lest you get caught up in their bad behavior. We teach our kids this principle, don't we? But when we see Jesus answer to them, we, we realize that there's something a little more going on in their thinking. Look at what Jesus says in verse 17. And when Jesus heard it, he said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. You see, these religious leaders don't think that they are sick. They don't think that they are sinners like these other people. They don't have the sin problem. Their separation is really an elevation that says, we're not like them. If we can just stay away from them, we're going to be okay and, and, and be pure. It's a separation-based righteousness that separates them from the category of sinner and thus away from actually seeking healing for their sickness. And you know, it's actually easy to get caught up in this kind of thinking, isn't it? Think about how I think about, I for myself, think about how I tend to parent my children, right? I think in these kind of concentric circles of separation, right? You can keep them home and safe, away from the influences of the sinful world. And maybe I let them out to you know, be at church and church functions where it's safe from the sinful world. And maybe I can send them to school or maybe a Christian school or at least a really good school, keep an eye on everything to keep them safe. And even their extracurricular activities, I can try to find Christian versions, 
keep them safe from the sinful world. There's some truth in that, isn't there? But the problem is, the message that starts to come across is, sin is out there. It's not in here. If I can just stay away from them, then I'll be okay. Stay away from that contamination, then I'll be okay. They learn over time to disdain the world. Right? Not have a love for the lost. And Jesus says, no. True religion that brings us close to God for real relationship starts with recognizing our own sin, our inherent sin, the fact that everything about us is tainted by our sin from the inside out. And it comes, true religion comes to God on His terms with nothing to offer, realizing we're sick in our sin, seeking His mercy and grace for me, thankful for His grace to me. And then it moves towards those of the world to reach out to sinners with grace, the grace that I've received. That's Jesus, right? He comes to this world, into this sinful world, to seek sinners for salvation. That's the heart of true religion. So Jesus and his teaching actions do not fit in the religion box of the Pharisees. And often, ours don't. Our separation righteousness. Now there's another quality to their religion box that I think uh, they think really makes them acceptable to God. And uh, I've, uh, I've titled it Joyless Ritual and you could add, and self-denial. read it, it's as clear as day, isn't it? <laughs> we see this in Jesus' next interaction with the people, uh, with the religious leaders, I should say, in verse, uh, in verse 18. Look at this. It says, Now John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting, and people came and said to him, Why do John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? And the accusation is clear. Jesus and the disciples are clearly missing out on this aspect of sincere religious effort, this fasting. The Pharisees and John's disciples are both very much engaged in this, I think for different reasons, but they both see this as primary to true religion. And the Pharisees, they were ma what I like to call master fasters. The scriptures actually only required, do you know how much, how much the scriptures actually only required fasting of a Jew, how often they were to do it? once a year on the Day of Atonement. Do you know how often the Pharisees required it? Twice a week, two days a week. They were to skip all their meals so they could focus on God. While everybody else was eating, they would be, no, we're, we're praying, we're fasting and we're praying. And, and uh, Make no mistake about it, they wanted everybody to see their sacrifice. In Matthew, Jesus speaks of how they would disfigure their faces. They'd put ash on themselves so that they would look really pathetic and as miserable as possible, that all could see their self-denial and sacrifice for God. Now, don't get me wrong, fasting has its place, and it can be a good way of focusing on God. But the Pharisees actually came to believe that they were cleansing themselves, purifying themselves to be holy before God by engaging in this miserable, joyless self-denial. I call this the diet and exercise version of religion. When we diet and exercise, we do it 
with a goal of some physical progress we're going to make. We figure if we deny ourselves all the good foods and limit our calories and we're kind of ruthless about it, and if we add to that pushing our bodies to do hard exercise so that we feel sore and tired, we may get miserable and grumpy, we may be hangry all the time, our kids may not want to be around us, but we do it because we think it'll pay off. Our systems will be cleansed and we will shed that onerous fat and get fit and healthy. And then, of course, people will respect our efforts. You've been there where they say, looking good, Gary. Well, not to me. But. <laughs> and stick with it. I don't know how you do it. You're half the man you used to be. <laughs> this is how the Pharisees were thinking spiritually. This miserable self-denial would really build up their righteousness before God. And would God would just have to give them the props. Well done, my good and fit servant. Way to be miserable for me. And of course, we, we have these remnants of thinking even in our evangelical circles, don't we? Christians who seem to function in this joyless, ritualistic duty, doing prayer and Bible reading and church like in a you know, routine on the elliptical. And strangely, we're sort of impressed by it. You know, we say, wow. You hear about that guy? He gets up at 4.30 every morning to pray. His kids hate him, but he gets up at 4.30 to pray. It's not that impressive, is it? And it's actually a good question for us. Is my Christianity, is my religious life mostly just joyless ritual? Am I just going through the Sunday ritual thing, keeping up appearances, trying to earn points with God through sacrifice, through the things I don't do, I deny myself of? This is the way most religions work, guys. It's not just the Jewish religion, it's, just, it's, it's the way religion works. This is what most people think is religion, and it may even have been their experience of church growing up, and that's why they just chucked it. Well, look at what Jesus says about this. Look at verse 19. Jesus said to them, Can the wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? They cannot fast. As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast in that day. You see, in those days, a wedding celebration was seven days long. It was a whole week. We think we have long receptions, you know, when they go till midnight. No, theirs went on for a week. It was a, one of the best times of their lives. And no one in the wedding party would ever think, hey, this would be a good time to fast. I think I just won't eat during the wedding. I'll be a little miserable. No. They would celebrate. They could, sell, they could fast after the wedding, but not during the wedding, not while the bridegroom was with them. In the Old Testament, God holds himself up as the bridegroom of his people. He's going to come to his bride, his people, and they're going to come together. We saw that in the book of Revelation in heaven, the big feasting in heaven, when God and his people are brought together. And Jesus, see here, is saying he's the bridegroom. It's interesting, we've been marking off identity mission call. Here's a little identity marker. Who does Jesus think he is? He thinks he's the bridegroom, and by the way, the only one who's the bridegroom of his people in the Bible is Yahweh. So Jesus thinks he's Yahweh, the bridegroom of his people, and he's there. He says, oh, this is a time of joy. This is a time of feasting. There'll be a time when he's taken away, when he goes to the cross, but by the way, Christians, he returned and he sent his spirit to live within us. And the New Testament is full of verses about the joy that we are to have as believers. This is why when uh, Jesus came to Levi and, and, and Levi followed him and his sinner friends, he didn't say, okay, you're religious now. Now come and fast with me. No, he said, come and feast with me. And they had a celebration together. This is why in the epistles we're just called to joy. I wrote down many verses on joy. I'm not going to read them now because it's so hot out here. We'll keep moving. But you can look them up. Just wonderful verses on joy. 
of being the Christian. So the Pharisees and scribes think true religion that makes you right with God and draw you draws you close to him is about separation righteousness staying away from sinners to avoid contamination but Jesus says no it's about recognizing your own sin and reaching out they think it's about joyless ritual to earn God's favor and the respect of man but Jesus says no it's about joyful relationship in him knowing God fully like a bridegroom to the bride in celebration and there's one more thing they're sure it's about the Pharisees one more part of their religion box, and we see it in the last two stories that are here in this text, the stories that have to do with the Sabbath. Look at verse 23 with me. One Sabbath, he was going through the grain fields, and as they made their way, his disciples began to pluck heads of grain. And the Pharisees were saying to him, look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And then quickly, you look at the next story in verse 3 about the man with the withered hand. It says, again, he entered the synagogue, chapter 3, verse 1. Again, he entered the synagogue, and a man was there with a withered hand. And they watched Jesus to see whether he would heal him on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him. These guys are just going along through the fields. They grab a little grain, stick it in their mouth, begin to chew on it. And they're like, oh, they're breaking the Sabbath. He goes into a synagogue, there's a crippled man, and they, they don't go, wow, he's a healer. What's he going to do for this man? They go, let's see if he breaks the Sabbath. See, what does that tell you about their religion box? is about rules righteousness and the more rules the better yes God had established the Sabbath as a day of rest so his people could take time out to remember him as their creator and Savior and enjoy their relationship with him but the Pharisees thought hey if the law is that they're supposed to rest on the Sabbath and do no work we can do better we can add all kinds of other little rules to make sure we don't even get close to working at all on the Sabbath. So they outlawed spitting, because that would be watering the ground, and that's work. And picking a single grain, even though in Deuteronomy it says you could do that if you were hungry. No, no, that, that would be harvesting, and that would be work. They even said if your house caught fire, you couldn't put it out, because that would be work. And ultimately, you couldn't even heal somebody on the Sabbath, because that would be work. It seems so religious and pious. They want to protect the law, so they're making more rules to put a hedge around the law, because they want to honor God by protecting the law. Sounds really righteous, doesn't it? In fact, the Pharisees ended up adding hundreds of such rules around the law. And of course, this kind of religion is still very prevalent today. I please God by keeping a set of rules, usually extra biblical rules. Where I grew up in the Midwest, I knew what those rules were. They usually uh, had to do with makeup and dancing and alcohol and mowing lawns on Sunday. I knew the rules. Somehow those were right up there with the Ten Commandments. And in Jesus, and, and Jesus, instead of answering the way I would have, which I would have just said, why are you being so stupid and petty? Jesus just goes to their scriptures in verse 25. And he says to them, have you never read what David did when he was in need and was hungry? He and those who were with him, how he entered the house of God in the time of Abath Abathar, the high priest, and ate the bread of present, which is not lawful for any but the priest to eat. And he also gave it to those who were with him. And he said to them, The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. He does two things with this scripture. He says, remember David, the anointed high priest, who had the authority to go in and overrule that law? That's who I am. I'm the anointed king who has the authority. 
but he also points out to them that they have it completely backwards, doesn't he? Completely backwards. I have to find my, uh, my notes here. Here we go. The Sabbath was made, he says, not to serve man, to give us, but to give us space to rest in the salvation that God has given us and enjoy life. But they've put so many rules around it that it's become a burden. It's become work to even keep it. It becomes a burden to actually rest on the Sabbath because they have to follow so many rules. I remember when I was young, my, my friend, I'd go to my friend's house and they had this living room that we weren't allowed to go in. We would look in there, it was perfect, it was like a museum. And uh, there was plastic on all the furniture. And I asked him one time, like, can you guys ever go in there? And he said, well, like, once or twice a year when there's special guests, but we have to be really careful not to spill anything and sit on the plastic. See, the living room was not serving them, right? I mean, they were serving the living room. It got turned around. And that's what they've done with the Sabbath. It's all backwards. And we see this ultimately displayed as Jesus goes to heal the crippled man. Look in chapter 3, verse 3. And he said to the man with the withered hand, Come here. And he said to him, said to them, this is the scribes and the Pharisees. Is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm? To save life or to kill it? I love it. He's just, he brought it down to the basic. Is it, is it okay to do good on the Sabbath or bad? Is it okay to say, kill or save? The answer is a no-brainer. It's obvious. Of course it's okay to do good. Of course it's okay to save life. Completely backwards because they can't even answer. They say it says, but they were silent. Because they're serving their religious rules. You see, these religious leaders are sure that true religion that pleases God separates yourself from sinners, is about joyless ritual and self-denial, and it's based in rules. And obeying rules for righteousness and they're trying to fit Jesus into their old religion box they're trying to stuff him in but he is about something that's so much bigger and radical and different he's God's king come to bring his kingdom he's the bridegroom come to claim his bride He's the Lord of the Sabbath, come to bring true rest. And he won't be forced into the religion box. He can't be. He'll burst it wide open. This is actually what he says very clearly in the middle of our text. Did you notice in the middle of all these stories, these conflict stories, there's a teaching. This is how Mark works, right? He has the teaching in the center, and then he has all the illustrations around the outside. They call it a Mark and Sandwich. So look at verse 21 with me. We skipped it over. It's right in the middle of this. Jesus says this weird thing. And this is the thing that people always ask about if you're reading the book of Mark with them. They're like, what is this about? Verse 21 says this. i got to turn to the right page. No one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. If he does, the patch tears away from it, the new from the old, and a worse tear is made. No one puts new wine into old wineskins. If he does, the wine will burst the skins, and the wine will be destroyed, and so are the skins. But new wine is for fresh wineskins. So is that right in the middle of this stuff? What's that about? Well, he's saying, look, you can't mix the new and the old. If you take a new patch that hasn't shrunk, and you put it in your jeans and sew it in, when you wash them, the new patch will shrink, and it will tear away. You take wine skins, which were filled with wine. They were a, like a, a skin pouch that would stretch out when the wine fermented. Well, once they're stretched out, you can't put new wine skin wine in them because there's no stretch left. And when it ferments, it'll burst them wide open. New wine 
is for fresh wineskin. Jesus is saying that they can't put him and his teachings in their old religious framework. And they can't try to mix them together. He will burst their categories wide open and destroy them. New wine is for fresh wineskins. They must be ready to be stretched and changed to have their boxes, their religious box, busted wide open. Why is that? Because what Jesus has come for is something much bigger than old religion. The king of the world, God himself, has come to give his life on the cross. And this is where the box comes in. You ever notice how a box turns into a cross? <laughs> That's a cross with the arms folded in a little bit. But you see, Jesus, he's come to go to the cross. He's come to bring in something completely different than their religion they understood. And he'll bust wide open out of their boxes. Instead of trying to please God by separating from sinners, the cross means we must recognize our own sin and come in repentance because he will take all our sin upon himself at the cross and take our judgment. He'll deal with it once and for all. The cross means instead of trying to justify ourselves by keeping laws and rules, which we could never do enough of, we can depend on Jesus' righteousness in our place, the true law keeper who keeps it for us and receive his mercy and grace and his forgiveness and cleansing. The cross means instead of striving in joyless ritual, we can rejoice in our own salvation and resurrection life as Jesus unites us back to the Father. You see, this can never be melded with old religion where man strives in his own efforts to make himself right with God. That's the same religion, that old religion, that we find everywhere today in just many different forms. And Jesus has come to bust that wide open. And it leaves us with a choice. Will we hold on to our own, our old familiar framework? Will we hold on to old religion? Or will we be willing to be expanded and stretched? Will we be, op will we be open to Jesus? Will we be fresh wineskins? It's actually not easy to do at all. What did the Pharisees and the scribes do? Did they hear Jesus and say, that's an interesting new teaching, Jesus. Let us think about that. Did they say, you know, what you were saying about sin being on the inside and therefore these external things not really being, that's, that's interesting. And I think if I'm honest about it, I struggle with that. Did they say, let us pray on these things and look at the scriptures? No, this is what they did, chapter 3. Verse 4, what did they do? And he said to them, Is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to harm, to save life or to kill it? But they were silent. And he looked around at them with anger, grieved at the hardness of their hearts. And he said to the man, Stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out, and his hand was restored. It's an illustration, right, of what Jesus is about. The man reaches out to Jesus in faith. And he's restored. This is his salvation. This is the religion Jesus has came to bring, come to bring. And the Pharisees, verse 6, went out and immediately held counsel with the Herodians against him how to destroy him. See, cancel culture isn't new, is it? They don't like what he is saying. He's stepping outside the box that they are sure is correct, so they will cancel him in self-righteousness. And we are so like this, aren't we? Even as Christians, the truth is we're constantly trying to stuff Jesus back into the religion box, making Christianity about following rules, 
and separation and joyless ritual. We just can't help ourselves. This is why we need him so bad. This is why we have to constantly come back to the cross. We must never leave it. And this isn't just something Christians struggle with. This is, this is so like our secular world today. Do you know why most people reject Jesus today? Not because they don't believe in God and are just hardened atheists. And not because they are just too scientific mind, minded and need more evidence. No, it's because they love religion. They love religion. They love that their little works and rules and rituals that they can cling to and, and, and feel like they have control of. And it gives them a sense of self-righteousness, especially in comparison to that other person. Even atheists have their own little standards of self-righteousness, don't they? We love religion. <clears throat> we cling on to it. So we all need to examine ourselves this morning. Are we stuck in the religion box? Or is our box stuck? Are we just trying to stuff Jesus into it completely unwilling to be stretched? Does what Jesus is saying here and what Mark is saying about him, doesn't it ring true of who we really are, of who God is? And if you feel like maybe you're being stretched this morning a little bit, but you're not sure you can get there, old religion is deep in you, ask Jesus to help you. Remember the crippled man here. He has that shriveled arm, just like that shriveled up wineskin, that withered wineskin. Arm he can't do anything about or do anything with, but he looks to Jesus in faith, and suddenly he's able to stretch it out as he's restored. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your son. We thank you that we don't have to be slaves to old religion that's hopeless. Soften our hearts. Open our minds to understand and our ears to hear. Break our stubborn wills. Help us to see our sin and to see your son and to see the cross and come in repentance and faith. And bust out of the old box. Help us to leave behind the misery of works religion and know the joy of salvation in your Son. Amen. Let's stand and sing together. Amen to that. May our hearts build, be filled with thankfulness for that work that Jesus did for us. Through his life, through his death, through his resurrected life, fulfilling the law, freeing us from sin, freeing us from ourselves and our self-righteousness.
outdoor service. Um, glory, hallelujah. Anyways, if you'd like to contribute to the ongoing ministry of CTR, the offering box is on the corner front row up here. And now receive the benediction. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy to the only God, our Savior through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 All right.